It's a pleasure to introduce our three poets today. Today we have Renee Gregorio, Allison Hutchcraft, and Marlon Fick, and they'll be going in that order. Uh, let me just let you know a little bit about Renee. Renee's poetry is informed by the landscape of Northern New Mexico, as well as her journeys around the world. And she's a longtime uh, practitioner of the Japanese martial art of Aikido. She founded and edited the Taos Review, which is one of New Mexico's foremost literary journals. And at present, she is a co-founder of the publishing collective Tres Chicas Books, mm -hmm. alongside uh, other colleagues as well. And they have a collaborative book Love and Death, Greatest Hits, which won the New Mexico Book Award for Poetry. And so we're looking forward today to hearing from Renee Gregorio reading from Abyss and Bridge. Thank you, Renee. Thank you. And thank you to um, Malaprox for hosting this reading. Um, I, I will be reading from Abyss and Bridge, which I'll show you. Um, it's a, a new book. Um, that came out from three Ataos Press uh, in June. So I've been doing some readings from it um, over the past couple months. The, so the poems in Abyss and Bridge speak to the echo between world and self, and often to how creating dialogue across difference can bring us actually into a deeper sense of belonging to ourselves, to the world, to each other. And I'm gonna read a selection of poems from Abyss and Bridge that um, some of them are centered in um, from home and several of them go to various places in the world, including India, Mexico, Italy, Greece, and Japan. I think I, think I covered them. Um, and I'm gonna start with a poem which is the first poem in the book. And it's called The Grace of Now. Sometimes seasons change in a whirl of wind, then smoke into being. Sometimes we turn a corner only to meet ourselves face to face. If there's trembling to be had, have it. If falling is the only way to touch the ground, surrender to what's startling and right. Fierce light rising over a dense mountain, the sound of water falling on stone, and this body, always this body, with its back of grief and front of desire. What would it be like to stay with yourself, not ahead as if running for a bus, not behind as if left on the platform by departing train. Just here, just now, in this warm still air, earth moistened by yesterday's brief rain. Know that, claim what is good, then get up, take your place in this world. This next poem is um, a poem that I wrote in response to a painting. So I was in a show with another woman at a gallery in Santa Fe and we, um, we worked together to create poem and painting. And it's called Seven Paintings Into One. Sometimes ink spills and this is exactly what needs to happen. Sometimes there's a point waiting to be driven far inside. Sometimes a flood of dark finds its course. Sometimes a path makes its way through triangle underbrush and weeping of sky. Sometimes we enter the water splintered, broken, emerge from the clear vastness through a tiny chink of light. Sometimes a thread falls down from the sky and we find a way to grasp it. 
Sometimes an edge forms like a tree trunk in our field and we place our backs tight against it. Sometimes it all fits together. Hole of light, unobstructed pathway, ink spot, water, drive, thread, edge, and we make ourselves whole. This next poem I wrote for um, a person who's been very important in my life and who um, parted the earth several years ago. And he's from Asheville, so I wanted to, to read this poem. Um, his name is Doug. The poem is called Increase. Looking everywhere for eyeglasses, I realize they're on my own face. Ordinarily, I'd laugh. But in this moment, this lapse of awareness stuns like that prickly pear cactus I landed on from the horse's back that first desert year. This fact is unverifiable. I want you in my life. This one, documentary, spindle, cell, solitary, fibrous, tumor. I cry. You say, all is wondrous from here. I say, I love you more than I ever did. You say this isn't about you, as the world's disruptions echo all around us, Mexico City earthquake, California wildfires, Puerto Rico devastation, floods in Bangladesh. Yes, even here in El Rito, the houses on either side of ours erupted into flame. These weeks of disarray, how do we hold each other's ruptures? You say you're grateful for the teaching of your dying. You want a collective awakening out of this devastation, your own, the world's. Once I said, I want the world to come to me and heard the world is in you. Now I know it's both sides of desire existing as one. The tears come and go for everyone. You, the Puerto Ricans, the Zapatista, the Mexicans, the fires, the homeless, this earth. You introduced me to some of my favorite humans in this life. I thank you for this and so many things. Awareness that helps me see beyond the glasses on my own face, even when I don't know they're there. Clear seeing, like the mountain stream that can't stop cascading, tumbles over boulders and fallen trees, ever increasing to its source. And now um, this next poem is um, after traveling in Sicily. And um, I have Sicilian heritage. My grandfather was Sicilian. And mainly in this poem, there are some Italian words, but they're all related to food and drink. So I think they're um, accessible. And there's a reference to um, Santa Lucia towards the end of the poem who was the patron saint um, of eyesight in the town of Syracusa in Sicily. Sicilian home. The words, as much as anything else, brought me home. Sound of vowels, exaggeration of sound, the way they felt in my mouth, the enunciation, birra, gelateria, Maurizio. All I had ever known, then more. Not just pasta, but breadcrumbs too. Not just any pomodoro, but those small, sweet bursts from Pacino. Not a few mediocre olives, but fistfuls of brined fruit. Not only a glass or two of vino rosso, but liters of bright complexity. So much I have seen, I seem to have already tasted. Fresh regatta filling 
breakfast rolls and cannoli shells, pasticcini made of mandorla, the kind of place that made me want to sketch it even though I can't draw. Background of church bells everywhere, a lone seagull on the stone cross above Piazza Sant'Andrea. Crumbling churches alive with oratorios, intricate carvings of cherubs, even statues of the virtues were voluptuous. Marble inlay, spiraled columns, lavish mosaics at La Matturana. So many people I seem to already know. The Italian actor who pulled me into him and smiled. The nun at Santo Spirito who effervesced feistiness behind her black rimmed glasses. The woman who, when I said my grandfather was Sicilian, ran her fingers along her inner wrist's pulse point. This place is in your blood already, she said. It lives there, and now you see it. Meandering the sapphire sea's path in Ortigia, I joined the grace of this city, even under the statue of Santa Lucia with a sword through her neck and her platter full of eyeballs. Grace in waiting, in not being at the center of anything. Remember in Caltagirone, how the man with a bandaged hand still spoke by gesturing with that hand. What a great place Sicily is. So many, so many places. <clears throat> that we've loved. <laughs> um, this poem is called The Snake Goddess. And the snake goddess was a, a figurine that was found in um, the central, sh central shrine in the palace of Knossos on the island of Crete. And actually, I'm gonna show you her because I have a, a replica of her. She's pretty amazing. <laughs> So this is the snake goddess. Unafraid, she knows what it means to grapple in darkness, to show herself. Breasts fully bared above checkered bodice, arms open, hands full of two live snakes. But who is this snake woman, priestess or goddess of the earth, of the mother, or of the household, her meanings disputed, but she knows who she is, woman of regenerative strength, lover of the underworld, who can deliver the herb of rebirth, who can hold what's writhing in both hands, the gaze of each nipple echoing the clear seeing in her eyes. She's great to have um, at my back here as I write. Um, okay. This is a prose poem that takes us to um, Kanor in Kerala, in the state of Kerala in India. And in it, um, in it, I meet a man who practices the martial art of Kerala, which is called Kalari Payatu. And I've been practicing Aikido. So when we met, this was our exchange. Far into nothing. He tells me, I could feel your strong energy immediately. He says this as his feet sweep and slap the floor as he crouches very low, a graceful leopard, his eyes focused as if on prey, his mind clear. He teaches me his moves, I teach him mine. He says, don't slap down hard with your foot, let it fall from the center of your body. The hand as sword is familiar to me, piercing his chest with it is not. Our roots intertwine, Kalari Payatu and Aikido meet at the confluence of the backwaters and the Arabian Sea. His hair is curly and dark. 
coil your body, he commands, as he demonstrates his own body spiraling into place. He says, this is a beady, these are two lips, translating a Malayalam poet. We're letting language and body find ground. Clear across the world, practices from another culture have the same lessons. No good or bad, big or small, no effort. Only follow the deep rhythm and shape of what's essential. The sea is calm. A white egret is in place on a circle of water. Six boys carry armloads of firewood as they flash by us, chanting in unison, hello, how are you? How can this road be so gritty, these souls so sweet? Sometimes it is necessary to travel a long way from all you know to reveal what you know. Going far into nothing, if the air is nothing, the sea is nothing, quiet is nothing, to know all you need. And I think I'll end on uh, coming back home to El Rito, and the poem is called El Rito. This blazing sky revealed behind white curtains, this unnameable color between salmon and rust with so much light behind it, I want to believe there's a doorway there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Renee. We really appreciate this opportunity to listen to your work and uh, let it wash over us. So thank you so much for that. Welcome. Our next uh, poet is Allison mm -hmm. Hutchcraft, and she's a former resident at the Sitka Center for Art and Ecology on the Oregon coast. She has been awarded a fellowship from the North Carolina Arts Council and scholarships from the Tin House Writers Workshop, the Key West Literary Seminars, and the Community of Writers. She teaches creative writing at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, and she'll be reading today from the 2019 Editor's Choice uh, book. She's the author of Swale, and that was named the Editor's Choice by New Issues Poetry and Prose. One of the things that Allison was quoted as saying last year was, one of the things that she loves about pro poetry is quote, how intimately it can bring us into another mind's unfolding, end quote. So it's my pleasure today to introduce Allison, who's reading from Swale. Thank you, Patricia, for that introduction and to everyone at Malaprops for um, making this event happen. It is a pleasure to be here and to read alongside Renee and Marlon. So thank you all. Um, I'll be reading from, from Swale um, today. And um, the first poem I'll read is titled Calenture, which is the name of a kind of mind body sickness that afflicted sailors when they were at sea. And sailors with Calenture would become obsessed with the hallucination of the open ocean as a field and they would do everything they could to throw themselves into it. So this is Calenture. I shouldn't like to think of them, but I do. The men who spent their days as sailors, pacing the decks of their ships, who sometimes would get a certain kind of sickness that made the sea a field how much the mind wants land after so much stretch of water, wants the most landish thing, a field thick with witch grass or blonding wheat, a meadow silent 
but for the ticking of insects. It must have felt like bliss, that first sight of the field so wide, like a yawn that never closes. Some say ships carried tufts of earth on board to bathe those afflicted, or when they finally reached shore, pressed the sailors' faces down into the dirt. From calentura, Spanish for fever, those affected had a fierce look. I know I shouldn't like to think of those men, but what it must have felt like, the field green and glinting in that sun, the few seconds in the air before they drop into those reedy waves, the unshorn grasses, their bare, unsinkable sway. This poem takes its title from something that young Charles Darwin wrote to his sister when he was anticipating a trip um, to, the, to the tropics. I have written myself into a tropical glow. The sea is laced in phosphorescence, little galaxies afloat in the swell. Insects click their invisible tongues to wake the silken light, volcano fire and lizard belly, dusky skies softening, bats unfolding, descending, as the barometer drops, stars pinned to their velvety seats. And the air, scented, swallowed, Insects falling into the open mouths of waxy orchid blossoms, spiny bromeliads, water pooling into sticky pitcher plants, tendrils curling, frogs bleeding their morning songs, the bleat that rises, billowing, filling the air like a flag or swelling like a sail. To not think of myself even for an hour, but of fireflies lighting the understory and everything tinged with this tropical glow, haloed, hallowed, steeped in bird song, the palm fronds pressing against the sky as if this world were glass and breath alone could make it flame. In the mid 18th century, um, the naturalist George Willem Steller was shipwrecked on what is now called Bering Island. And um, while this shipwreck was a catastrophe for many, many of those sailors, um, for Steller, it was a gift. Um, it was there on Bering Island that he first saw and studied the enormous sea cow, which is sort of, um, a large, very large 30 foot long relative of the manatee. Um, and it was about three decades after Stellar saw the sea cow that it went extinct. So this is Stellar and the sea cow. To be thorough, a naturalist must sometimes kill. Piling up birds, toads, fire-striped salamanders to procure the best specimen. Shipwrecked Stellar too was meticulous, climbing the carcass of the sea cow, which they had dragged onto the beach by a hook, their knives tearing the flesh less when the cow at last stopped thrashing. It was hard work, perhaps not worth the tobacco he promised the men for their labor. Afterwards, they returned to their true task, months still left to reconstruct the ship and the naturalist to his, 
measuring the animal from tip to tail before opening her side to excavate the organs. Finally, Stellar was alone enough to note the thick ridged cutis and lice-like parasites feasting in the folds. It was a topography he could cut into. Tawny, black, he thought, like the skin of a smoked ham. The cuticle bristling with small raised cups and deeper, tiny perforated holes like those of a thimble. The kind of hide when hung up to dry, you could strip like bark from a tree. Where to begin? Snout, lips, villous and rough as a hairbrush that would not soften when boiled. The tongue dumb at the mouth of the throat. Nothing proved too large, small, or crude. Not the stomach once stuffed with seaweed in which multiple men could lie. Nor ulna, radius, forked tail. Nipples wide with lactation. The delicate urethra emptying. And when he dissected the head, how carefully he sliced skin from the eye to see the sticky lacrimal sack, large enough to hold a chestnut. It took every effort, mounting again and again the height of the abdomen, plunging the knife deep into recesses between bones, into subcutaneous fat. When punctured, the plush mammary glands released what was left of their milk, and Stellar found that it was sweet, yellow, the color of light through sheer curtains to which he woke as a boy. Imagine Stellar, flush with his work, ignoring the stench of dead sailors, half buried in the sand and scavenged by foxes. As he stares out to the sea, to the rocky cliffs studded with mammoth bones, to the sea cows still alive and feeding, the seals curling under the waves, the fog lifting, into what the future will be. A couple of years ago, um, there was a, a news story that was circulating um, throughout the media and it was accompanied by a photograph of um, uh, the remains of a jaw um, from a medieval nun, right? Um, and there in her teeth were these bright shards of blue, which turned out to be, to the surprise of the scientists, lapis lazuli, right? Um, which showed that she indeed um, was someone who had illuminated manuscripts many centuries ago. And so that, that news story um, brought forth this poem. The lapis lazuli in which she dreamed. None of the middle centuries, nameless scribe, who divided hours into lines, parchment inked in script, seraphs thin and nearly translucent as insect wings, moths to her candle, or frost on warped monastery windows. It's probably true that she did not speak, at least in the silent scriptorium where her nimble fingers fashioned illuminated pages, saints and hooded beasts, angels and men with their flattened faces, flattened feet, halos of hammered gold. She painted bones loosely in the skin, 
as if they too could fold time over time, like the delicate ribs of an accordion. It was she who worked the lapis blue, grinding it to dust, pestle and bowl, dipping horsehair brush into pigment, then sharpening the tip between her lips, her tongue and its secretions, leaving quick shards of ultramarine in the tartar of her teeth. This is how we know she breathed. Remains sifted from the sludge of anonymous graves, gunless jawbone blooming under microscopes, unmasking residue of precious stone. What's it like to be gone for good? Name sandblasted from the registry, brain for the last time hauled up from sleep. On once medieval plains, leaf rustle, nest of twigs, tilled soil, and cloistered farther in her bed, a pummeled sack of hay, where sometimes she felt flashes of a god alight, soundless as a feather, hollow spined. Dead nun, those veils of paint, scraped skies, divine light. The thoughts I think I could have had, had I believed a blue celestial. Swale. In my winter by the sea, I fashioned a new habit. Each day walking to Crowley Creek through mud and leafless alder, their branches cupped by the plush green of mosses and rolling beds of sword fern, whose serrated edges thrust extravagantly into cold and humid air. The creek fed the estuary which in turn fed the sea. And I liked to see how far up the tide had reached or how far it had receded. The marshy banks transformed by that lunar clockwork on which my hours turned. Water called slack, like the grip on a rope loosened, at which point the river would swell and still, the brackish tide having expanded the limits of the creek, submerged grasses swaying like the drowned hair of a doll. Cold and hard and clear, the water looked like the creek I felt in me. Day after day, I watched gulls float like wooden toys rocking on the unsteady surface and studied barnacles clasped to rocks, the shell white skeletons of small shoreline animals, discarded limbs of driftwood. Swale also meaning a depression, a low place in the land the sour smell once the water has drawn back, unmasking river sludge and battered sea debris, luminous blue valella with their fan-like sails, hollow carapaces of crabs picked at and cleaned. When I swale, I cannot tell border from border, land from water. I feel the long of day crumble. Washed up, what's left? An accumulation of silt or sand sifted, rubbery tendrils of seaweed dotted with notches like taste buds inflamed. Sometimes I think love 
is swale, and sometimes sadness, how each comes in like a tide, how each alters the bodies beneath. Heart, be complete. Come out of your grave light. It was decades before I was alive when the estuary was diked to make more land for water. The water no longer water then, but fields of sown grasses for the cows to eat. How they too must have tasted it. The memory of water buried in the new green shoots. The verdant nourishment still tasting faintly of brine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Allison. Thank you for reminding us that the natural world has so many metaphors to remind us about the connections between human beings and everything around it. Uh, that was uh, truly evocative and you're a sensitive and keen observer of that. Our next uh, poet is Marlon Fick, and we're delighted to have him join us today. Uh, he is an associate professor of English and chair of the Department of Literature and Languages at the University of Texas Permian Basin. And he holds a BA in philosophy from the University of Kansas, an MA in poetics from New York University, and a PhD in English from the University of Kansas. He's authored three poetry collections, a book of short stories. And in 2015, he published the novel, The Nowhere Man. And he specializes in comparative poetics. He's an editor and translator and he's been writing music since he was 13 years old. He'll read today for us from The Tenderness and the Wood. Thank you, Marlon. Uh, thank you, Patricia, for that. Um, it's, really, it's really great to be here. I convey my thank you to Miriam also and Stephanie. Wonderful. It's a little hard to follow these other poets, Renee and Allison, and, and the Blue Celestial. Um, yeah, I'm going to go out and get your books immediately. Uh, so this is from The Tenders in the Wood, uh, which, which, which I got the National Endowment for, um, but I couldn't get it published for about 10 years. It sat on Jeffrey Levine's desk. And, so finally, OK, finally it's out. So, the poem Swallows is a little bit like, uh, it's a little inspired by the idea of Rilke chasing after invisible angels. It's an elegy for my wife and daughter, uh, Laura and Sophia. And it's in seven parts, so I'm only gonna read this one poem. Um, I'll just say one, two, three. The, the first line is, one day in October, the swallows were suddenly gone, and so was I. One. I step out of a valley carved by an old river and into a desert. Which way, I ask the prophet with a lazy eye. Which, where the dry leaves drift, burning, erasing the places we pass, the signposts. Children forget their parents. Woman whose name I don't remember. This dog bites. Her music was so sorrowful with beauty, the fingertip fail of an idea, irreparable length of one's life in the body of a terminal stranger oneself opalescent, shimmering, and trailing the bright white gown of its coffin. She lay under the perule with the wing, wind entangled in its arms and smoke from sandalwood. She suffered the sting of the flower. Her body held on to its heat like a sea, and the sun went down like a ship on fire. There is rest in change and rest in letting the lightning steer. The dry bed of the river forks and veers away as if looking for you in a desert. Some hold on to each other and won't let go even after the breath is gone. Two, shouldn't you be finished being dead? Return to where knowing remembers before memory knows. Ah, oh, but you know, you know. We are, you and I, one opalescent word, drifting aloft, auroral and soft, a man and woman whose compass whirled once around the world and stopped. Let me with the animal side rising 
lift me with the animal inside, rising and twisting in its shell. Three. Raspberries cold in the icy morning shine in the gauzy mist. One swollen, I gently loose, letting it wet my fingers crimson, leave the pale ones on the vine, letting the stalk fall back in the weft of ferns, wet sm smell and ether from the pines, the magic in her nearness, so delicate, perfect, raspberries, embers, red, darkening in my hand. For the world has left a note inside my sleeping, but I am not ready to wake. I am not ready to leave this clarity behind, nor willing to come down from the cold mountain. Perhaps I will come, when I have something to say that is as beautiful as this wind that strums the pine it passes through. Five, the caress of your fingers through hair, a blessing as it was at the beginning of the world, when there was yet no you, no paths to follow, at each crossroad, each station and checkpoint, where we pause to consider our love, only the delicate dice of your fingers. Six, clarity turns out to be an invisible form of sadness. I journeyed to cities and continents following swallows. The lights of the blue boats illuminate in lavenders and lilacs, the left and right banks, casting drift nuts of shadows from magnolias and mimosas across the gray facades, revealing smooth stone and black lacy iron across bridges. Rapid streets and slower alleys converge and reach back to the sound of chiming dishes, animated talk and sirens, windows of silver orange uh, ocean perch, blue mussels, lemons, everywhere the smell of wine, perfumes, wet cobblestones, grass, and white marble. If the city seems clear, it may be because the air is cool and motionless while the metro sends vibrations through the pavement. Pedestrians bid for the streets with cars. The bookstalls sell the best literature and the worst. Straight buildings and even streets and even streets and cobbled alleys leaning each into each each into each like friendly drinkers time past and time present are swallows curved and linear the arching note of a clarinet slurs just inside the mouth of the metro seven locusts wind in the dust then left their delicate shells on the elms and singing departed holding one up to the fading light i did not see how beautiful your song then nothing remained but songs, like nothing remains, like stones that suffer the same sun each day, the same cold. I had one to sing to my lover, to her naked, death-infested body, and one to her tear-smeared face in my lap, and one to sing against the ceiling of the leaves. The city in its crisis of color, magnolias bloom in the sun aligns with the windows of the cathedral. Each flying buttress itself a stroke of time, keeping perfect shadows. Thunderhead blue vaulting the blonde fields and the shudder of thunder receding. Inside, the air is a cold remembrance, a smell like the soil of March, eat or ether in grass after dusting rain. Letting go of the past, the mirrored arcades with their columns of rain. The past yet still present in her tangled sheets, as if wandering in passages through her body open doors and empty rooms, subways, finding in her caught in branches of rain the webs of memory echoing in the subterranean, traveling through her, wondering if I am dust or if she is, dust and darkness, its song of opalescence showering down in the ether. I fling myself, scatter myself on broken stones beside her, joined like stones join, to make one arch, one tributary moment, infinitely receding, opening, vanishing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marlon. Uh, your poetry certainly reminds me of the way that grief and seeing memory through that refraction is uh, so palpable and it can just permeate everything we encounter, edifice, body, um, flower, everything. So thank you all. Uh, thank you so much for that.
I wonder if the, in the few moments that we have left, if each of you would be willing to say a few words about, if not what poetry means to you, uh, what role poetry has played in your creative lives or uh, your means of expression? Renee should go first. On <laughs> All right, Renee. All right, then. Um, so thank you, really, everybody. That was really wonderful to hear both of your work. Um, and I think uh, poetry is, it's, it's several things, you know, it's an awareness practice. I mean, it's a place where I get to slow down. I get to look at the world around me. I get to um, feel that world, feel other humans. Um, and from awareness into um, understanding, you know, into it's a place where I get to really delve. And I love that about poetry. And I as much love that there's a huge mystery included in that in that we don't often know, I often don't know where a poem is headed and, and that the poem is teaching me as much as, you know, I might be looking out into the world to, to know something at a different level. I'm being led and taught along the way. And I love that. And it remains mysterious to me after decades of writing. Yeah. Thank you, Renee. Allison, I'll just um, I'll just say how much I love your work, Renee, Marlon. What an absolute gift to hear those poems, um, and how e all of your work um, that you shared with us today brought me to these very specific places. Right, I felt um, like I could see. Um, the world as the as the speakers were seeing those worlds around them and how intimately the attention of language being placed on the page in those ways allowed me to travel to those places with you and um, to be in those other minds minds that are not mine um, and to and to see and feel what the world is like through those lenses um, so I'm just I'm absolutely thrilled to, um, to have met you and heard your work and um, now to get your books because they're just, they're gorgeous. They're beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I, 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 I really don't know where to start with that question. Uh, you know, I think that it's, uh, it's a way to make things that are very difficult, uh, even, even ugly, uh, palpable, uh, through, you know, and I'm teaching a course in Shakespeare and just, I marvel at how he can take blood and violence and sex and death and lies and, and make it all uh, sort of <laughs> entertaining, you know, that's a, or it, it, he raises it to music. He raises it to something that aspires to music. And also, yeah, the, the, the word that Allison used to travel and you're traveling, uh, and I noticed in, in Renee's poetry and Allison's both, that, and, and mine certainly, we're not local poets per se. You know, we're, we're poems happening in Sicily and, and the Bering Strait. And, um, and in my life, I've lived in, in China and West Africa and Europe and, and Pakistan uh, and Mexico for 15 years. So uh, I just try to think of poetry that way that it expands the, the landscape. And, and we're able to travel to places, but also to in other people's consciousnesses. Consciousnesses. Uh, uh, I, I can't separate it from music, you know, it's just, it, um, the image. It strikes me that listening to the three of you as a person who's not a poet, um, I'm, uh, I'm in awe, I feel like, uh, our founder of our bookstore, Malaprops, uh, had a great reverence and respect for the poet. And she's a writer and a poet too. And so every time uh, we have poetry, I am 
uh, in awe of the poet's ability to succinctly capture and communicate an idea or see something anew or show me something I never even thought of or even take something I thought of, but I never thought of it like that. So I want to salute you all and to express so much gratitude uh, to you, Renee, and you, Allison, and you, Marlon, for uh, sharing your work. And I want to encourage our audience today to please uh, purchase their poetry. And if you can't purchase it from Malaprops, please uh, consider supporting your local independent bookstore because uh, local independent bookstores are the lifeblood of every community and they seek to elevate uh, the, the poets, the writers, the creative people who are searching for a way to explore even the, the most uh, quotidian to the global. And I think that's what uh, you all have done today. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to uh, another round of Poetry -o next month. We hope you have a wonderful Labor Day weekend and uh, stay safe. And thank you for joining us today. Renee Gregorio, Allison Hutchcraft, and Marlon Fick. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>